One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's get going today. Uh, welcome. Welcome to our second official week, even though we get like one actual day uh, of classes this week. So be it. I hope you enjoyed your nice long weekend. And I hope instead of just taking Monday off and doing nothing, that was never intended to be a day of rest. That is supposed to be a day of service. That's what Dr. King intended. Uh, and so I hope you found some time to do good with your time and to help make the world a better place. Uh, the world is not going to get better sitting on a couch. I promise you that. Okay. All right. So um, we'll get into lecture in just a minute. We got a lot to cover and I'm going to kind of try to fly through some of this stuff. A couple of reminders before we get there. Don't forget about your first real homework assignment that's due. This historical glossary part one. Do yourself a favor, right after this class, click on that and read the assignment, what is gonna be required, because this is the biggest, we're gonna be doing this same assignment kind of over and over and over in the class. So get used to it and get good at it now. That's really gonna help. Make sure when you're doing this, that you are going up here, you see the exam study guides. Click on those and make sure you're using the one for the Europe exam study guide okay that's the unit we're doing this time so make sure that that's the study guide that you're using uh and then you're just simply going to go through the terms and you're going to write like mini paragraphs for each one of the terms define it describe it explain it and most importantly okay this is where it's going to be a little different i want you to tell me how you intend to remember that term so there's a lot of terms in history. It's like any professional field. If you wanna be an engineer, you need to know what the coefficient of drag means, or when you go into a room with other engineers, you're gonna look like an idiot. Here's the thing about history. Yes, there are tests in the classes, but life is your real test. If you walk into a room with other people, when we actually get to do that again, and they're discussing the American Revolution, and you don't know what the they're talking about, you're gonna fail that test. Now, we need to be able to understand history, but we need to be able to understand the terms and the basic ideas of history. So that's what you're gonna be dealing with and grappling with. That is due by Monday at noon. Do not leave this, okay? I strongly recommend, there's a lot of terms to go over. Start this today. If you got any questions, I have office hours today from 12 to one. And I'm also available always by email. So please, if you got any questions, please reach out and ask. Uh, okay, any any questions on that before I really dive into the, the material for today? I want to make sure I got everybody. Uh, okay, I think I got everybody on the list. Okay, so today, let me do my thing here get this up okay today our theme is genius what is it how do you make it is it possible to actually create a genius now every single one of your parents probably tried to do this right um, they played Mozart to you when you were in the womb and they exposed you to a great education and books and all this stuff, right? All in an effort to maximize your potential. Here's the sad thing. None of that matters. Okay. I could take Jace, Jacob and Tyler and put you guys both in the exact same room, expose you to the exact same things. And one of you might turn out to, a gen to be a genius and the other might be a drooling idiot. Anybody want to guess on who's going to, I'm thinking Jake, I don't know. I don't want to pick on anybody. It's a little early for that, right? But, you know, at least Jacob's brave enough to leave his camera on. So he's my victim for today. You're welcome. Maybe some extra credit in there. You'll be all right. You're a tough guy, right? You can handle it. We'll see. Okay. We'll see about that. If you're crying by the end, then I know I did my job. 
that's messed up. Anyway, okay, so none of that stuff matters. You know what really matters to creating a genius? The single most important thing is character. The, the word that we often use in education is grit, okay? But probably the better word is determination. Are you determined to succeed? Because it doesn't matter how good or bad your teachers are. If you're determined to succeed, you will. But if you're determined to fail or you just don't care, that'll happen too. You'll just fail, okay? If you don't do the work, you don't care, that's entirely up to you. And it has nothing to do with the quality, the good or bad of your teachers. All of your success is going to be up to you, okay? You will always have bad teachers. I guarantee you will have bad bosses. But if you continue to blame other people for your success and failure, you're never going to achieve. So we know that it's determination. Here's the thing. It's not all these advantages. At least one third of the people through all of history that have been labeled as geniuses lost their fathers at a young age. Another third of them lost their mothers at a young age. We're talking before the age of 10. So that makes life more difficult, not less difficult, right? And yet these people will still be determined to achieve. We see this again and again through history. We also know that the vast majority of, of geniuses emerge out of cities because cities establish the environment for growth. You have all these different ideas and places to go and things to see, and that feeds the brain. You know, yes, we need farmers. Yes, we need people who live in the countryside, but very few geniuses actually come out of the countryside. Almost all of them come out of this urban setting. Probably the greatest sign of genius, and this is what I'm looking for in your historical glossaries, is simplicity. Can you take complex ideas and explain them in understandable, simple ways? Take, well, what's the classic here? E equals MC squared, right? I know that's not quite right, but this is a complex idea. But if I can explain to you that in this right here, if I can split the atoms in this, if you take the mass of this single pen and you multiply that times the speed of light, which is really, really fast, that's how much energy is trapped inside this pen. All I have to do is break open those atoms and I can blow apart this world. If you can take the complex and make it understandable and simple, that is genius. That's what I'm looking for. That's what all your employers will be looking for at some point. So we see this again and again, but especially during this time, and let's let's bring it into what we're talking about, this period that we often refer to as the Renaissance. That's where I really want to begin our history for today. This is, everybody knows this term, right? It all, everybody knows, what does it mean? Somebody help me, what, what does Renaissance mean? Uh, period of enlightenment? Mm, to an extent, yeah. What's the literal translation of Renaissance? Taj, you look like you were coming in there for a second. Yeah, rebirth. There you go, literally. Yeah, exactly. So this just quite literally just means rebirth. But rebirth of what? The rebirth of the ancient glory of Europe. For a thousand years, Europe was kind of like rural Georgia, okay? No offense. I don't think we have anybody from rural Georgia, but nobody wants to go there, okay? Like you drive through it as quickly as you can so you don't end up there, okay? Nobody wanted to go to Europe after the fall of Rome. For a thousand years, it was dirty. Uh, people could barely feed themselves, but that all begins to change here in Italy. A lot of this tracks back to the Crusades, when Christians started to try to retake the Holy Land. What this really does, they fail in that attempt, okay? They're not able to retake the Holy Land, but they are able to reconnect to the outside world. And as the European population starts to grow, they now have surplus goods that they can start to sell. And that reconnects them to the outside world. And this 
that dark ages is dark because they hadn't been connected to the outside world. And the end of that dark ages comes with this renaissance, when these ideas coming in through trade, through Italy especially, because of its location, these merchants start spreading out all over the Mediterranean, on into the Atlantic, up into the North Sea, and they start trading for goods that they couldn't find in Italy. And they become, okay, Italy becomes the Walmart of Europe. Let me ask you, does Walmart actually make anything besides miserable employees? No. No, they don't make anything. They just get goods from where they're made to where you want to buy it. And they become fabulously rich by doing that, right? That's what Italy figured out. They were the middlemen. They didn't make hardly anything except rich people. So they went and found goods that were rare and brought them to Italy or to other places where they were wanted. Basic market economics, supply and demand. The rarer the supply, the higher the price, especially if demand remains steady. So Italy, suddenly money starts flooding into Italy. This begins about 1350 is when we have the date roughly for the beginning of the Renaissance. And it begins in Italy. Everybody's heard this story, right? This is where we get some of the great geniuses of the time. But I don't want to spend a lot of time looking at these geniuses. We'll talk about a couple of them. But I want to talk about why they became geniuses. So now we have an urban set setting like we talked about. Many of these people have struggled greatly in their lives. Leonardo da Vinci was, excuse me, no, it was Michelangelo, was literally a hood rat living on the street when he was discovered. He was making sketch drawings and a man named Cosimo de Medici, the richest man in Italy at the time, just discovered him when this little hood rat comes running up to him and wants him to buy his sketch. He hired the young man, sent him off, taught him, and he becomes one of the great artists and geniuses of his day. We'll look at Da Vinci, we'll look at Michelangelo in just a minute, but the central idea that is driving the Renaissance is what is known as humanism. And this, this is central to what I do and, and how I teach and, and how I want to live my life. This is the idea that every single human being has a unique perspective, that your point of view is just as valid and worthy as mine. This is the idea that we, through our own unique perspectives, can view the world in unique ways, that you as a human being have value, no matter how you label yourself or don't label yourself, gay, straight, white, black, it doesn't matter. You as a human have intrinsic value. That was not true before the Renaissance. Life and death just came and went. But now with this Renaissance, we tend to take a new perspective. This means, though, that you have a responsibility to develop yourself. This is one of the big reasons you're in school, to add value to your labor, but also to make yourself a better person. Everybody complains about having to take these gen ed classes, right? Well, I want to be an engineering major, so why am I in a stupid history class? To make you a real human being. Right now, most people are like Pinocchio. You're wooden, you're a stick figure, and you see the world only through your own perspective. Classes like this are here to develop those skills of seeing the world through other people's eyes. The word is empathy. And guys, I don't know how to teach you how to give a shit about other people, but I'm gonna try. If you don't already, that's a problem, but we're gonna work on it, okay? This idea of humans, humanism, that everybody has intrinsic value. This is a new idea, that your perspective is just as valid. And this is why we have artists doing crazy things. Look, look at this. Take a second and actually look at this. This is one of the most famous sculptures in the history of the world, certainly in the Renaissance. Everybody's seen it. Anybody know what it's called? Say it, Taj. Um, is that the, I don't, is that the Sistine Chapel? Uh, fair, 
Statue of David. It's in the Sistine Chapel now. That's right. Jacob, what is it? It's the uh, Statue of David. Yes, this is just simply called David. Anybody know the artist? Michelangelo. Exactly. Excellent. Okay, take a second and focus on the hands. Look at those things. They are freakishly large, aren't they? If your hands looked like that, people would be like, what the f is wrong with you? Go see a doctor. Okay? He's, he's not properly proportioned, is he? Not at all. And, you know, well, I have to admit, when I take my shirt off, that's how I look. Why is my wife laughing while I say that? What, why are you, what, what? Quiet woman. Now I know like every guy, you, you take that off, pow, and you got these things that make the girls go, woo, right? Okay. Like everybody's got those, right? Is that how the typical man looks? No. no. It was the ideal. Does a real human being even look like that? Exactly. Excellent. Well said, Jacob. It's the ideal. Even though it's out of proportion, when you look at that, you're struck by its beauty. Whether you admire the male figure or not, whether that's something that turns you on or not, you still have to admire the mastery of that craftsmanship. Realize that came from a single block of marble. One mistake with a chisel, and there's no super glue, babe. You're starting all over. The mastery of that, that you can see the veins in his skin, the balance of it. This is just incredible. From this, we get an explosion of learning and art. New perspectives, new ways of looking at the world. And of course, my favorite of all of these is da Vinci. Everybody's familiar with this man. He is what today we would call a polymath. Somebody who is excellent at many different things. He's an outstanding uh, uh, drawer, painter, sculptor. The list goes on and on and on. Now, here's the thing. He practiced humanism to become an expert. At the time, the Catholic Church said that the body is the temple. So once you're buried, that's it. There are no autopsies. There's no cutting open the human body. God made you the way that you are, and you are a sacred temple. It was exactly, it was against the law to do autopsies. But da Vinci wanted to know how the human body worked. So he paid people to dig up these bodies, and at night he would cut them open and he would do these careful anatomical studies. Look at this. He had notebook after notebook after notebook filled with these drawings of the anatomy of the body. This is something totally unique in European history. This had never been done before. But through that careful and intensive study, he is able to create this. Now, this is what is known as the Pieta. And you, you'll see many, many different depictions of this, of the broken body of Christ being held by his mother, Mary, that shattered child. And you can feel her pain. Now, none of you are probably parents, but I think you can probably imagine the agony that your mother would go through holding your shattered, broken body in her arms. And you can see it there. And you can feel it. That is stone. It is cold, lifeless. And yet, look what da Vinci does with it. He takes the idea of humanism, that he needed to discover what was really going on in the human body. Who cares what the law is? Who cares what the church says? Do what you know is right. You don't need church to tell you what is right, do you? If you don't know the difference between right and wrong, you don't need religion. You need a soul. There's a difference. Now, what's really scary for the people in power is that this separates their power from their people. Very quickly, these humanists, they don't, many of them will continue to create works like this in praise of God, of the Christian God. And yet they're starting to explore the world, not without the need for God, but trying to look for ways to explain the world without 
needing God. For example, today we know that thunder is produced by hot air hitting cold air. And yet for centuries, the idea was God was angry. The angels were playing bowling or whatever it was. We had these, these spiritual uh, uh, examples or explanations for natural phenomena. Here, humanism breaks that down. And now we can start exploring the world as it is from our own unique perspectives. Oh, by the way, while we always remember the artists, does anybody know who paid for that statue? Does anybody care? You know, it's, it's funny. The people who pay for this art are called patrons. And they're very rich people. And oftentimes, you know, okay, if you, when we can go back on our campus, you'll go on the campus and you'll see this building and there's somebody's name on that building, the Sears Applied Science Center, whatever, okay? Somebody rich paid for that name to get on that building in an attempt to try to stay immortal, to stay alive forever, to be remembered after they're dead. But do you know who Sears was? Do you care? No. In the end, oftentimes the people that are immortalized are the artists themselves. And so while these patrons of the arts, these rich merchants are going to pay all of this money for these great pieces of art, we don't tend to remember them. We remember the creators. Guys, be a creator. Be somebody who makes something that exists beyond you. That's how you will be immortalized. Don't just leave a tombstone, leave something. Leave something that others can remember you by. Otherwise, you're just gonna be another piece of dust. The problem is though, all that wealth that paid for all this art also attracts other people. And so the Renaissance continues in Italy for about a hundred years until you get some Italians who wanted more and more power. There's a great book about this. It's simply just called The Prince. It's by a, a writer named Machiavelli, and it's probably one of the most important and well-read political treaties. How do you gain power? Let me ask you this question. This was the central question of this. If you're in power, would you rather be loved or feared? And I'm going to wait. I want to see what you guys think. Which is more important? Which would you rather? Would you rather be loved or feared as a ruler? Um, I think I'd rather be loved as a ruler because when you think about fear, fear often drives people to do things that ordinarily they wouldn't do. You know, fear is the reason why I believe we have certain because people are scared of what it is that could happen. So I'd rather be yeah. loved to try to alleviate those problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Fair enough. Let me ask you this, Tosh. Doesn't love come and go? And doesn't love make people do stupid shit too? I think so. But when you are a person who has a sound mind and knows how to carry themselves, knows how to discern from what is actually right, wrong, what's truth and what's not. You're able to guide people in the right way, even as a leader. So mm. the spirit of the people is the spirit of the leader. Interesting. You make a lot of assumptions though there that our leaders are people of sound mind, that they're there for the benefit of the people they're leading. That's not always I, the case, is it? Yeah, Go when, ahead, you I'm sorry. Do, when you do have a leader as such, not necessarily saying that we do have a leader as such. I think that the, like I said, the spirit of the people is the spirit of the leader. So if we have a sound line, what you're going to find is that many of the followers or uh, that are going to have um, unsound minds or there's going to be turmoil um, in the rest of the um, population. Well said, well said. Machiavelli completely disagreed with you. 
Machiavelli said that it is better to be feared than to be loved. Love comes and goes. Love is fickle. How many of you have been in love with somebody and then you're just not? But fear stays. Fear motivates and fear drives. Now, Machiavelli is actually writing this for a young prince who wants to take care, take control of all of Italy. He's actually the illegitimate son of the Pope. And he wanted to prove to his daddy that he could be a big man. And so he stupidly goes out and makes a deal with the French king. He asks the French king, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to bring your armies in and invade Italy. And then when you're done, give Italy to me. Here's the problem. The French army came in, invaded Italy, and then they stayed. And so this prince, instead of getting everything he wanted, he ends up destroying much of Italy, and the Renaissance flees and leaves Italy. And at this time, about 1450 or so, this is when the Renaissance moves out of Italy and moves into Northern Europe. And we start to see some pretty important transformations here. While humanism is still important, this is much more, it's also been called the Christian Renaissance. Because it's during this period that we have much more art dedicated directly to Christianity. It's much, it's much less about humanism and individuals than it is about serving patrons and serving the church and the state. Art in the service of those in power. So we're going to see that become a little bit different. But what this does is it opens the door for some of the most important transformations in European history what we refer to as the Protestant Reformation. Oh, I spelled that wrong. You guys know how to spell. Um, this Protestant Reformation, the date for this is 1517. Now, the man you see there with the double chin, that is Martin Luther. Everybody has heard of Martin Luther. This was a man who, when he was when he was brought up, his dad wanted him to be a lawyer. And he was very smart. He went to law school. He did exactly what his daddy said. But then one day he had this very important moment. He was riding on a donkey through a forest during a thunderstorm, and a bolt of lightning comes crashing out of the sky and blows apart a tree right next to him, knocks him off of his horse, and he's in the middle of this terrible storm, and he's terrified, and he does exactly what almost all of us do when we're terrified. You reach out to God, and you make a promise. You say, God, if you save me, I will fill in the blank. Now, do we usually do the fill in the blank part? Not usually, but Martin Luther did. God delivered him from this, and Martin Luther promised that he would give up a life as a lawyer and he would become a priest. And that's exactly what he did. But we have to remember that training that he had as a lawyer. And that's why he does what he does. He's, he's kind of an outsider coming into this late. He hadn't been brought up in the church as a priest, so he's coming into this later in life, and what he sees around him is not what he thinks the church should be. Instead, the church is corrupt. Most priests at this time were illiterate. Guys, imagine if the preacher in your church couldn't read the Bible. How the hell are they going to be your minister? They can't. In many cases, these priests would just memorize five or six uh, uh, lessons in Latin, and they would give the same sermons over and over and over again. By the way, by this time, the only people who spoke Latin were the priests. So now you're in church, you're hearing some guy drone on and on the same thing in a language you don't understand. Is that going to bring you closer to God? Absolutely not. This is boring. It's awful. On top of that, the upper levels of the church are incredibly corrupt. Church offices are being bought and sold to the highest bidder. Uh, many of the church officials have mistresses. Many of them are, are involved in what today we would call pedophilia. Some really, really bad behavior. Okay, so bad Catholic priests that is nothing new, okay? That's been around for a long time. No offense to my Catholics out there, but there's a long history of this. And so in 1517, 
Martin Luther writes down this list of arguments about what is wrong with the Catholic Church and how it can fix its own problems. This is known as the 95 Theses. And he takes a special day. He's really smart about this. There were like 60 Catholic holidays per year. He waits till one of these comes along, and then he nails these 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg. And here's the thing. We know that people were already criticizing the church because these ideas take hold very quickly. Some young people actually take this to a local print shop, and they have they have these 95 theses mass-produced and sent out all across Europe, and this starts a new fire. Before Martin Luther, every person in Europe was a Catholic. Okay, Anybody know what Catholic actually means, what that word means? <laughs> means okay. universal. No. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jay. Go ahead. No, you got it. Okay. Um, this is a claim that your religion is universal. It's the absolute right one. It's the one that ties everybody together. But suddenly with Martin Luther, now you have a different interpretation. Martin Luther actually, he, he thumbs through his Bible and he literally just randomly thumbs through and he sticks his finger down and he hits a verse in Romans. And it says that justification comes through faith alone. That is his conclusion, a humanist conclusion that you don't need a church to be saved. You need your own relationship with God. You don't need a priest to forgive you. You just need to ask God for forgiveness. Can you see the connection between what he's doing and humanism? Without humanism, you wouldn't have the Protestant Reformation, and you wouldn't have most of what we call Christianity today. The problem is, though, this almost immediately leads to what is known as the Wars of Religions. For the next 300 years, Europeans are going to mass murder each other according to what religion they hold. Catholics will murder Protestants. Protestants will murder Catholics. People started having to move out of areas that are Catholic. If you want to be a Protestant in France, they had a term for them. They were called Huguenots. That's just a Protestant living in France. It was illegal to practice that religion. And if the king of France caught you, he would murder you. So this becomes wars of religion. Now, if you but today, so many people are talking about a civil war. That sounds all nice in books, but when people come to your house and rape the people you love and murder you and steal all your shit, guys, that civil war ain't so awesome then, is it? These wars of religion were the most destructive wars in European history until World War I. That's how incredibly destructive these were. This will include the Hundred Years' War, and the Thirty Years' War as well. These are incredibly destructive wars, and they're going to tear Europeans apart, and it's going to drive Europeans out of Europe. This is one of the biggest reasons why they come to the New World. If you're living in the middle of a war zone, you don't want to be there. And so when somebody gives you an out, like, I don't know, sail halfway around the world and start all over again, you would too just to get the hell away from this. Guys, this is not religious freedom, but this is where religious freedom and more importantly, religious toleration come from. Because Europeans will look at this madness of people murdering each other in the name of the exact same God. And they'll come to the conclusion that this is just crazy. And maybe I should just let Jacob worship whatever he wants. And Tyler, whatever you want, man, as long as you ain't hurting anybody else, you know what? Your religious business is none of mine. Don't care what you worship, and it doesn't matter. That's your decision. That's between you and your God. Guys, that idea isn't here yet, but we're moving in that direction. And we see that enshrined in the American Constitution. But that's quite a ways away from where we are now. One of my favorite examples of this, of course, is England. 
Henry VIII and the Six Wives of Henry VIII. Okay, so everybody's heard this story. There's an entire series on this. You can watch the Tudors. It's a really pretty good uh, historical series. Henry wanted a male heir. But none of the women that he married could produce a male heir that survived. They would have females or no children at all, or their male babies would die very early on. He needed a male heir. There was no such thing as a, a queen of anything without a king, not at that time. So he keeps divorcing or beheading wives. Well, the first one, the Catholic Church gave him, okay? Yes, you can have your divorce. That's cool. But then when he went to the second one, the Catholic Church said no. So Henry breaks off from the Catholic Church and he forms his own church. It's called the Anglican Church. Today, we call these guys Episcopalians. They dress just like Catholics. They even, like, the priests have the little collars and, and all that deal. Uh, the churches are very ornate. Uh, he breaks off. Here's what's really genius about this. This is how the English crown and monarchs became fabulously rich. He seized all of the Catholic property in England and made it his. This is why the Queen of England is still the richest landholder in all of England, because her ancient ancestor seized all of that Catholic property and claimed it as his own. That includes property belonging to not just the church, but to any Catholic in England. And he starts to persecute Catholics in England. The problem is, once Henry dies, then one of his daughters takes over. This is Mary, Queen of Scots also known as Bloody Mary, because she began to execute Anglicans. Well, that sets off a civil war in England until Elizabeth I takes over, and she makes England back into an Anglican country and starts to persecute Catholics. In fact, she sets up a colony in the New World. It's called Maryland. She names it after her now dead sister that she had executed. And that was supposed to be a colony where Catholics could come and be protected in the new world. Guys, that's even written in the Constitution of Maryland, but it only lasted for five years. And then Protestants took over control of Maryland and began to persecute Catholics. So even here in the new world, they're not practicing religious toleration. Far from it. You had to be a member of a church, you had to pay taxes, and you had no choice as to what your religion was. So this is just crazy, okay? You can see as all these different religions burst out, and there's tons of them. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the list goes on and on of these guys. Mostly we tend to think of the ones that have lasted, like Lutherans, Calvin. My favorite is a guy named Zwingli. Now, so now you have humanism, and it's up to each person to interpret the Bible themselves. But the problem is, without training, a lot of people end up misinterpreting the Bible, like Zwingli. Zwingli argued that, uh, you're going to love this, how many, I, I want to see how many would want to go to this church. Zwingli said that because you were brought into this world naked by God, that's how you should always remain. So these people were nudists. And every Sunday, they would get butt naked and march their way to church. They would sit in those pews for hours, butt naked, sweating, and then they would have another parade back home at the end of that. Raise your hand if you want to go to a butt naked church, sitting next to your mom and grandma, butt naked, sister, brother, your dad is just dangling out there. I don't see a lot of hands raised. How odd. Huh. Wonder why that religion didn't last. So we're going to get a lot of these kind of what today we would call wackadoodle ideas, but they're very much humanism. It's up to you to interpret that Bible yourself. And without training, oftentimes people interpret it just plain wrong. All of this is made possible because of the power of the presence. Now, I'm not talking about media. I'm talking about the printing press. 
Now, the man that we often give credit to for the invention of the printing press is this man, Johannes Gutenberg. Now, here's the problem. And here's where we have have this problem in world history where oftentimes, and this is a justifiable argument, white people get credit for what brown people already did. Okay. By the way, in China, they had the printing press for a thousand years before Gutenberg invented it. So why do we always say in Gutenberg invented it? Well, because most people don't really know their history. But these new ideas, like Zwingli's writing that you should be butt naked, their followers could take this to the local printing press, get it mass produced, and it goes out to all the people. This, this is what drives this. But even more importantly, this printing press is what is going to drive the next great revolution in European history, and that is the scientific revolution. Now, for many of you, this is going to be much more comfortable of a topic because we're moving away from religion. We're talking about hard science here. Now, if you're living in chaotic times in which people are mass murdering each other in the name of God, can you see why some people would want to turn to a different way of living? Instead of basing your life on the passions of religion, instead, they began to base their lives on rationalism, reason, and logic. And in fact, uh, some of the greatest minds of this age would argue that reason and logic are the greatest gifts that God gives us. And if we don't use those gifts of reason and logic, and guys, you can look around in America today and realize there's a whole lot of people not using that reason and logic, right? I can present many people with perfectly good evidence, and then they will reject that evidence because of how they feel about it. That's not ration. That's not reason. Here, this scientific revolution is going to challenge many of the assumptions of how the universe looks, but this is going to be based on evidence. By far, probably the two most important men in this, first, Nicholas Copernicus. It will be, whoops, it will be Nicholas Copernicus through his new invention. The telescope was brand new at this time, and he applies this looking at the stars. And he realizes that the old way of understanding the universe, everybody knows what this is, right? With the Earth at the center of the universe. Instead, he gathers evidence and argues that, no, that, that doesn't work. The model doesn't work based on the observable evidence. So if your model doesn't work based on evidence, then your model has to change. This is like today with the flat earthers. They deny literally every bit of evidence that disproves their theory. Guys, that's not learning. That's a cult. Okay? If you refuse to obey, to believe evidence, to allow evidence to change your mind, you're living in a cult. It might not be a religious cult. It might be a cult of some other belief, but you're still in a cult. That's not a healthy way to live your life, guys. It is Copernicus who is going to instead argue for a heliocentric, a sun-centered universe. Now, over time, with observations, we realize that our universe is far beyond the solar system, and it expands almost into infinity. And according to the best evidence we have, it's still expanding. Guys, think about this. This is not just important for science, but think about it emotionally. Raise your hand, raise your hand if you're the oldest child in your home. Who's the oldest? Taj is the oldest. Ashley, uh, uh, got a bunch of you. Okay. How many of you remember when your younger brother or sister was born? Can you remember how the house changed at that time? Suddenly, you're no longer the center of your parents' world, are you? You're no longer at the center of everything they do. You're just one more planet. For Europeans, this idea that the Earth wasn't the center of God's universe, 
that we weren't the most important, biggest thing in all of the universe. This doesn't just change the way you understand the nature of physical reality, but also emotionally and spiritually. Suddenly now you're just another rock. And now that we've found literally billions, if not trillions of stars, just like ours, are we special? Are we somehow, are we the only human beings, the only life in this entire universe? Are we the only people that Christ died for? If you believe in Christianity, does that mean that Jesus had to go to every single planet and die there as well? Every planet where there's life? These kind of questions are difficult to deal with. They're emotionally difficult. My personal favorite out of all of these is, of course, Sir Isaac Newton. His three laws actually bring into physical reality the dream of the ancient Greeks and Romans, that through careful observation and evidence, we as humans could understand the laws that govern reality. And when you understand those laws, it's almost like you're God. Now, we know that Newton's laws weren't entirely right, but for centuries, a friend of mine teaches physics, and and he actually tried this as an experiment. For, For 15 of the 16 weeks, he taught this physics class based on Newtonian physics. And then that last week, he came along and said, okay, everything I taught you is wrong. Einstein comes along, and his new theory of relativity destroys the Newtonian system of reality. And then he tested his students. Which system do you think that they still relied on, Newton or Einstein? Uh, Einstein? No. No, good guess, Joshua. No, they still relied on what they knew before. These really intelligent, well-trained students did not take this new evidence and allow it to change their lives and the way they understood the world. And I know you see the same thing going on around you today. Most of it's related to politics today, isn't it? If people love Trump four years ago, they love him today. Doesn't matter what he did. If people didn't like Trump four years ago, they like him even less today. It doesn't matter what he actually did, does it? Don't be like that. Allow new evidence to change your mind and recognize that nobody is entirely evil and nobody is entirely good. The scientific revolution, my favorite part about Newton, okay, the guy is is a polymath, he's a genius. When, When the Black Plague came along, he was actually teaching at Oxford in Cambridge. And he already, at the age of 26, he was the chair of the mathematics department. That means he was better at math than everybody else in the country that they could find. At 26, this guy is already a genius, recognized. And then the plague comes along, so they shut down Oxford for the summer. He went home and he was bored. So he's playing around and the math that he knew wasn't working to solve his problems. So he invented a new form of math. It's called calculus, and it is invented to torture undergrads. I don't see any other purpose than to just drive you people crazy. How many of y'all have had to take a pre-calc or a calculus class? And yet you didn't blow your brains out, so good for you. I mean, oh my God, I, I, I still can't get, my dad is an engineer, he specializes in math. He cannot explain to me the purpose of calculus other than to make people miserable. I'm sure there's a purpose, I just don't care. That's, that's how smart this guy was. He's bored, so he invents an entire new branch of mathematics. Now, here's the really interesting thing about him. He also practiced what today we call alchemy, that ancient practice of trying to transform metals or one element into another, specifically in this case, lead into gold. Now, today we would call that magic or pseudoscience. The line was much less clear then. He also is best known, and I'll let you go right after this, about optics. And you can see that here, where he's using a prism to break light into its component parts. 
Uh, thank God, because this then gives me the cover to one of the greatest albums of all time, Dark Side of the Moon. If you haven't heard that, you should. Okay. But Newton wanted to make sure that his eyes weren't fooling him. So very few people knew this. He actually cut a slit in the corner of his eye and he pushed a mirror back behind his eyeball so he could look at what was going on to make sure that this wasn't an optical illusion. Would you do that for science? Would you do that for anybody? Hell no. But those are, and, and of course, it's his theory of gravity. Guys, he did not see an apple fall from the tree. Actually, he did. But what's left out of that is he saw an apple fall out of the tree, but in the background, the moon was also falling at the same time. And he came to the conclusion that the same force operates on those two bodies in exactly the same way. And that's where he comes up with his theory of gravity. All right, I've held you guys a little bit too long. Make sure you're keeping up with your homework. The first historical glossary is due on Monday by noon. Uh, I will see you before that for class. Make sure you're keeping up with the writing and we will pick up where Jacob wanted us to go next time. And we're gonna pick up with the enlightenment, okay? Keep up with the reading, keep up with the writing. If you got any questions, come to office hours or shoot me an email. Otherwise, have a great weekend and I'll see y'all on Monday, okay? All right, any questions? Uh, uh, let me open it up. If you don't have any questions, you can go. If you got any, you can hang out. Uh, otherwise, thank you guys. I appreciate your attention. Hey, Professor Settler. Sir. Hey, uh, hey, you have a few minutes so I can pick your brain. Uh, I emailed you yesterday about an assignment that I had. Yeah, yeah, just hang out, man. Just hang out and we'll, we'll get to that, okay? Good. Give me just a second. See if anybody else has any questions and then we can do that, okay? Do your thing. Thank you, Mr. Sadler. <coughs> so what, Taj? I'm sorry, what? I said thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your contributions, too. Thank you. Thank you.